Good morning, and welcome to St. Luke's Online Worship. Before I share a few announcements, I do want to take this opportunity to thank all veterans. Uh, we celebrated Veterans Day last Wednesday, and we appreciate your service and continue to pray for our active troops. St. Luke's, as I stand here in the narthex by the angel tree, is once again partnering with the United Way and the Salvation Army to support the annual Christmas Bureau. So you can help children ages zero up to 13 who need toys and clothes for Christmas by picking up one or more of the angels or stockings here in the narthex. Please return the items to St. Luke's no later than December the 6th. Also the game night that was scheduled for this afternoon in the Family Life Center at four o'clock has been canceled due to the increase in the number of COVID cases here in the county. Next Sunday, try to get to worship early if you're coming in person because the youth and the handbell choir will be uh, sharing music as we prepare for during the prelude beginning at 1045. And that's a wonderful time to, to be in prayer and listen to beautiful music. 1045 next Sunday for that prelude. United Methodist Men, as you might have already heard, have put out a challenge to raise money for a second uh, touchless water cooler for the children and the faculty at Beaumont School. We've already raised the $2,000 to purchase one, and the Methodist Men have made a $1,000 challenge for the church if they will raise the other uh, $1,000. The Methodist Men will pay theirs, and we'll be able to buy two water coolers. They're touchless during this time of COVID. So if you'd like to contribute to that, please do and designate your check to Beaumont School. And finally, Corinth Reformed Church next door to us is hosting their annual community Thanksgiving service on Thanksgiving Day at 10 a.m. Uh, no registration is required, but please know that masks are mandatory. Thank you, and let us worship the Lord. gang it's uncle charlie and today i want to show you something really cool having to do with prayer you know prayer is how we talk to god and it's a very important part of our walk with him right but do you sometimes have trouble thinking of something to say when you're praying <laughs> yeah i think that happens to a lot of us right well i'm going to show you something today that will help you remember some things to pray for it's called the five finger prayer Okay, try this with me. Make a prayer hand in front of you just like this. You know, like you see in pictures all the time of somebody praying. Okay, make those prayer hands like this and let's take each set of fingers one at a time. Okay, first let's take the thumb. Now the thumb in the prayer hand is the closest one to us. So that should remind us, let's pray for the people that are closest to us. Like mom and dad, like brother or sister. How about grandma and grandpa? So who could you pray for today? Now let's take the next finger. Now the next finger is what we call the pointer finger because you see we point with that finger, right? 
Well, you know, there's a lot of people in our lives that point us in the right direction. Let's say like teachers, Sunday school teachers. How about our children's pastor, our minister? People outside of our family that point us to the right way. Let's pray for those people too. So who could you pray for today? Now the next finger, the middle finger, is also the tallest finger. See how it's taller than all the other fingers? That should help us remember to pray for those who are in leadership over us. People in powerful positions, let's say like the President of the United States. How about your school principal? How about police officers who try to carry out the law and protect us every day? Let's pray for them too. So who can you pray for today? Now let's take the next finger. The next finger is called the ring finger. And you know, that's the weakest finger of the whole bunch. As a matter of fact, it's even harder to move this finger the way that I did the other fingers. So it's the weakest of all the fingers. That should remind us to pray for those who are weak. How about those who are poor? How about those who are sick? Those who are having a really, really hard time. Let's remember them in prayer too. So who can you pray for today? Now let's take the pinky finger. You see, the pinky finger is the smallest finger, but it's also the last finger. So that should remind us that, you know what, it's okay to pray for ourselves, but you know what, let's pray for everybody else first and keep ourselves last. So when we're praying for ourselves, we can pray for anything. So what is it that you wanna pray for today? So there you have it, the five fingers of prayer. Isn't that cool? So just remember, you can pray for those that are closest to you, you can pray for those who point you in the right way. Pray for those that are in leadership over you. Pray for those that are weak and need some help. And then you can pray for yourself as well. Hey, and don't forget one more thing. See that? That's the palm of your hand right there. The Bible says that we're in the palm of God's hand. And God takes care of our needs every day and blesses us with so many blessings. So you know what? We should be thankful for the many blessings that He gives us. So what can you be thankful for today? Make sure and thank God for it, okay? And include that in your prayers. Hey gang, feel free and watch this as many times as you need to so you can remember the five fingers of prayer. So go ahead and start practicing now. God bless, and I'll see you here, there, or in the air. Thank you.
Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him, to say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. And it's in his name that we gather for worship today. Whether we're worshiping at home, online, or here in this sanctuary, we thank you, O oh God, for the privilege of worship, of drawing before your throne of grace to share our joys and our concerns. This past day, we celebrated and paused to give thanks for our veterans on Veterans Day. And today, we thank you for all veterans active and retired, and we continue to pray for those on active duty. Thank you for the service of all. And Lord, we are in another service. We're in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're called to be about his business during our lives, to be his ambassadors, his representatives each day. And while we maybe frequently fail to live up to his standard. We thank you for your grace that allows us to try again the next day. And with the help of your Holy Spirit, may we grow deeper in our faith and more mature and more like Christ our Lord. Father, we pray for this church, for its future as we navigate through this time of COVID, when we're apart, we thank you for the connection that we're able to maintain, and we're grateful for the hope that we have of being together again in the foreseeable future. We pray for the church in our nation, that we would all be able to remain strong and steadfast and continue to be about your mission and your ministry. Where there's hurts, we bring healing. Where there's hopelessness, we bring hope. Where there's sadness, we help to bring peace and joy. And dear God, thank you for your gospel that enables us to live every day with those very things, hope and joy and peace and love. And we pray for your church worldwide. Many are undergoing persecution, that you would keep their faith strong and vital as they continue to be lights for you in many dark places in our world. Lord, thank you for your word, for it is truth and the privilege of reading it and reflecting on it each week. And we pray this day that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and give us understanding and lead us to where you want to take us this day. Lord, for those in this world who are lonely, many being shut in and unable to see loved ones during COVID, many who are bereaved, we remember the lonely today and we lift up your promise that you will never leave us or forsake us and even when we're physically alone you are always there always ready for prayer Lord forgive us of our sins 
where we've missed the mark and fallen short of what Jesus would have said and done in any particular situation. But assure us that when we turn from our sin and toward the cross and confess, there is forgiveness, a fresh start, and hope going forward. So God, we commit this time to you and pray that your Holy Spirit would engage us however we need to be engaged this day so that when this time of worship is over, we will be able to move on with life knowing without a doubt that we have encountered you during this time. In the name of Christ, the head of the church, we come to you and pray the model prayer that he taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We've spent the last 12 weeks on the worship series, practicing the promises of God. And we reviewed how our seeming obstacles are God's gleaming opportunities. And when we cannot see God's hand, we trust in God's heart. We've learned how we will do even greater things than Christ. How God steps in to help us engage us for our good. We looked at how God reconstructs our cracking and crumbling lives and how when God forgives, he forgets. We looked at the throne of grace in the, as a means to God's grace and mercy in our lives and the, how the righteous will live in faith. We've also looked at over the dreary of valley of dry bones the sunrise of hope rises in our lives. And last week, Pastor Chuck delivers a message and reminds us the promises of God's plans for our lives that flow like the jet stream and how we can remain faithful in our lives and our plans by following that stream in our life. 
Today, we will finish up this sermon series as we look at how the rails of God's love undergirds us and goes with us always. That nothing will separate us from God's love in our lives. As I began to think about this scripture from Romans 8, that nothing would separate us from God's love, I kept thinking about tracks or foundation. You know, we learn in scripture that that Jesus is our foundation. And when we're planted on a firm foundation, that nothing will help us to falter. That we will rise up, that he will give us strength. And I began to think about a roller coaster. Now, I don't know about you, but many of us have probably ridden roller coaster, and there's a thrill in that. There's a track, a solid base that, that takes a car up a hill and through twists and turns, and, and there's a lot of fun, and there's a lot of fear, and there's excitement, and there's thrills, and there's anxiety. There's a lot of emotions that's wrapped up in that. And that sums up a lot like our faith journey. It's much like a roller coaster ride. So here's some fun facts for you in case you didn't know. The Smithsonian published a list of 14 fun facts on roller coasters, and I'd like to share a few with you today. On August 16, 1898, Edwin Prescott, a roller coaster designer from Massachusetts, was granted a patent for an improvement to a roller coaster that ride enthusiasts have come to take for granted, and that's the vertical loop. While the roller coaster depicted um, by Prescott was later realized as the loop the loop roller coaster at Coney Island, it wasn't the first inverted ride. It did usher in a safer way. Instead of being a complete circle, they began to optimize and to tweak it to be a little bit more um, elliptical shaped loop. You can still see that roller coaster at Coney Island. Number two, it may be hard to believe with the roller coaster named Daredevil, Steel Vengeance, and The Beast that these were initially developed as distractions from Satan's temptations. Yes, there was a roller coaster that was developed to keep people away from harm and from the distractions of going into sinful life. In 1884, a Lamarcus Thompson got so frustrated with the life and the amusement that people were taking in by going to saloons and brothels that he created an amusement for people to be able to go to so that would divert their attention. And he invented Switchback Gravity Railway, a patent coaster that visitors to Brooklyn's Coney Island would ride for five cents. Isn't that amazing? And then predating Thompson's um, Satan Distractor by a few decades was the Mock Chunk Switchback Railway, and it was uh, built in 1827. It was a coal uh, car railway where they would take coal up the mountain about five miles. And then in the evening, it became um, an adventurous place for people to go to ride back down the mountain. So it acted as a dual place. Third, did you know that if you have kidney stones, a roller coaster may be the very thing that you need to ride? Fun fact You should go to Disney World. Yes, Disney World. Prescribing patents prone to the conditions have planned a trip to the amusement park to ride Blue Thunder Mountain Railroad as a form of preventative care. Now, I don't know how much that is true, but in Smithsonian's facts, they say it works. Sounds like a pretty wild ride, right? but wild enough that it has worked for many people. So if you have kidney stones, that may be a fun fact for you today. So the next one is the tallest roller coaster. Now I know when you see this picture, you're probably gonna gasp and say, I can't ride that. But this roller coaster is here in the United States. It's the world's tallest and it's Kinga Kinga Ka at Six Flags Adventure Um, in Jackson, New Jersey. 
How many of you are ready once you've seen the picture? Probably not many. If you are ready, you are one of those uh, really thrill-seeking uh, persons that like to ride those. This roller coaster is um, one of many that look the same but um, is not as tall. Next, the fastest roller coaster is Formula Rosia at Ferrari World in Dubai. This baby goes from zero to 149 miles per hour in just 4.9 seconds. Now, talk about a bad hair day, that's probably what will happen in that. Um, you'll peak at a maximum height of 170 feet and get an adrenaline rush worth 4.8 Gs. That is amazing. And then the longest roller coaster in the world is the Steel Dragon 2000 at Nagashimi Spa Land in Japan. Steel Dragon is 1.5 miles long and goes four minutes. So who's ready to ride a roller coaster? Well, today as we talk about that, I want you to think about if you've ever ridden a roller coaster. You, I remember the first time I rode one at 12 years old, it was Thunder Road from Carowinds. And I got in line and I was antsy and of course my, my excitement was there and I wanted to get in the car and I was riding by myself because my friend wanted to ride in the back seat and so I read, rode in the one right before her. And so as we entered the car, I was scared. I, I wanted to make sure all the, the seat belts and the, and the bars were there. And I wanted to hold on because I, I didn't know what to expect. There was a lot of an, anticipation. There was a lot of fear. But there was also a lot of adrenaline and excitement. As the car started to move, you know, you hear those familiar sounds. Click, 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 click. As you go up the hill. And then you get to the top of the mountain and then there's an adrenaline rush as you fall. There's a, another way of thinking about this that I want to address today. The promise that God goes with us. And one key scripture that tells us this is the Great Commission. You see... After Jesus' death and resurrection, he gathers the disciples on top of a mountain. Just like gathering up on top of a hill, on the top of the roller coaster where you can see for miles. And he gives them this message. Go, therefore, make disciples in all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them the ways of the Lord. And I will be with you till the end of the earth. He gives this promise on this mountaintop. Can you imagine the excitement, fear, doubt that was playing in the disciples' minds? Scripture tells us that they were excited, but some doubted. When the disciples were commissioned... We have that same excitement. We are commissioned as faith people. We're commissioned and we too have experienced a mountaintop experience, whether it's when we first found out Christ for ourselves, where we come into a faith, or maybe it's when we had a baby, or, or maybe it's when um, we experienced life in a new way, being an aunt or a grandparent. Maybe it was when we got married. Maybe it's a job performance or maybe it was on a mission trip that you experienced this wonderful moment where you got to see God and it was just this high point in your life. We've all experienced those. But when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he knew that not every moment was going to be a high moment. He knew there would be valleys and there would be twists and turns in our journey, which we call our faith life. But yet we have a promise that he will never leave us, that he will be with us. So what does that look like for us today? I share with you, Kelly and Tom felt the power of being on the mountaintop in the spring of 2018, when they attended the Walk to Emmaus, a weekend, 72-hour spiritual retreat. 
They worshiped, prayed, and learned more about God. They shared a love for God together and had a clear vision of what God wanted them to do when they returned home. They could not contain their excitement. They were on that mountaintop. And they had two girls, Amber and Haley, both in their 20s, working and living at home. Tom, newly retired, was embarking on a new chapter in life. And both Kelly and Tom were um, journeying toward a deeper walk with Christ, wanting to live out their discipleship in some new way together. This was beautiful. And the day after the retreat, Amber, their daughter, shared she was not feeling well. She was experiencing constipation with swelling in her abdomen. She had been to the doctor the prior week and was diagnosed with IBS, but something did not seem right. Kelly took Amber to the urgent care where they examined her and did an ultrasound. They found a cyst on her ovary and they sent her to Charlotte Novant for more tests. The doctors were ready to perform surgery, but her calcium levels were too low. So they were diligently giving her infusion so that she would be able to have surgery. By Monday, her calcium levels had returned to normal. And the following day, she had surgery. Once she got into surgery, they realized that there was more going on in Amber's body than what they had detected. They found that she had small cell carcinoma, ovarian cancer, with hypercalcemia, which is a rare and aggressive form of ovarian cancer. Kelly and Tom found themselves falling down the mountain into a valley of fear. What seemed like the happiest days of their life quickly turned into a journey with their daughter through a difficult and painful illness. Our faith takes us on many many turns. There are highs and lows. When the pains of life strike along our journey, we can find ourselves falling quickly from the mountaintop into that valley. How do we respond? What do we do? Who do we turn to or lean on for support and comfort? Romans reminds us that we may face hard times, hardships, or loss, persecution, famine, nakedness, or danger. And the promise is for us today is that God will never leave us, no matter what we endure. Kelly and Tom knew God would never leave them. And they reached out to God. They cried out. And in Psalm 50, 14, God tells us, Call upon me in the day of, uh, day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. And that is what Tom and Kelly did. They gave their burdens to the Lord knowing he would take care of Amber and them. They reached out to God and heard the Christ surrounding them with support care and love from a church and community. All of us, not one person, is going to be able to stay on the mountaintop. We're all going to endure the hills and valleys of life. We will face times of hardship and distress. We will find ourselves in places where we feel like we are alone and that we can't go through the valley. But yet, God tells us, I will never leave you, and God is there. I know this all too well. In 2004, my grandmother passed away. And in that, um, it was really hard. My seeing my mother walk through this hard time of losing a mother to a battle of leukemia. And after the, the morning after she passed, my mom was in the living room and she sat and she prayed to God. And she said, God, I don't know where you are, but I don't feel you right now. I feel lost, I'm hurt, and I don't know what to do. And she began to cry. And she wept in her hands 
as the Lord heard her. And she got up from the sofa and thought, I've got to stop crying. I've got to stop having a pity party. I need to move on a little bit. So she, when she rose from the sofa, she went by this bookshelf. And the bookshelf had a one piece of paper sticking out. And she tried to push it in. And no matter how she tried, she wanted to rip it out. And as she did the words to majesty was on that piece of paper. And that was my grandmother's favorite hymn. And in that moment, my mom knew that God was with her. We say these familiar words at a funeral. Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff They comfort me. My mom felt the comfort of Christ in that moment through those words. And it reminded her that she didn't walk this road alone. That God was right there with her. In Revelation 21, we see he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. He wiped my mom's tears away that morning. This year, we have experienced so much death in our country and our world. And this is a promise that we can hold to, that God is there to wipe our tears. God is there to walk through that shadow of death, that valley that we may face. I'm reminded in another scripture that another valley that we might go through is persecution. And I'm sure those of you at home and those of you in in person have been persecuted at one time or another in your life. And as I, I thought about this in the times I had been persecuted, I thought about Joseph. Joseph experienced hard times when their his brother threw him into a pit. They were jealous. Granted, Joseph was a little arrogant, but can't we all be at some time a point? But out of their jealousy, they wanted to kill him. They put him in a pit and was going to sell him. And in that moment, the Midianites came by, plucked him out of the pit, sold him to the Ishmaelites, and took him to Egypt. And when he got to Egypt, Pitiphor had an officer of Pharaoh, was an officer of Pharaoh, and bought him from the Ishmaelites. And scripture said, the Lord was with him. And from there he became a successful man. God plucked him from a pit of persecution from his brothers. And he can pluck us out of a pit of persecution from this world. Isaiah 41 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not dismay, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Christ are the tracks that help keep us going when we can't go any longer. So what do we think about when we go hungry or naked and we see so much homelessness and those that really have a passion for social justice? The first social justice activist was Jesus Christ. He clothed the naked. He fed the hungry. And we see this all too well, even in the Old Testament, where the Israelites move out of the land of Egypt and where they ate and they became hungry. It says in Exodus 16, 1 through 3, that it was 15, it was the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, when the whole congregation of children of Israel complained against Moses. 
They were in the wilderness and they cried out, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this wholesome, this whole assembly with hunger. They were so hungry that they were dreaming of the good old days of slavery in Egypt when they supposedly had full stomachs. So even in our whining and complaining, the Lord answers. And in this, he tells Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. Each day, the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. He will not forsake us. And in Matthew, he reminds us, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor what... What nor about your body, what you will put on it. Is not life more food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, of being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. God takes care of us. His promises are true. He will never leave us or forsake us. No height or depth can keep us from the love of God. And no matter what happens in our journey, the promise of God is a firm foundation that we can count on. In Deuteronomy, we're called to be strong and courageous. We're not to fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord our God who goes with us. He will not leave or forsake us. Our promise today is affirmed in John 3.16. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that nothing in this life or after could separate us from love. And today we stand here on a mountaintop of hope, knowing that the roller coaster ride we call our faith journey will take us through many twists and turns. But the one thing that is constant is that the Lord Jesus Christ travels with us through the power of the Holy Spirit, giving us strength for each step of the way. All we have to do is stand firm on the rails of his truth. Now each of us hold fast to the love of the Lord for us this day. May it be so, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
as you leave here today, this time of worship where we've had holy time to worship together, to pray, to learn about God's promises. I send you out knowing that God goes with you. Hold fast to the love and the promises of God. Let them be the tracks that keep you grounded as you go about your journey through the hills and valleys. Amen.